Luke chapter 2, Luke 2 chapter 2 verse 12. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. God, the king of the universe, the king of the universe, the king of heaven, was not born in a palace, but he was born in a barn. The king that the angels cry, holy, 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 was not born in a palace. He was not born with people bringing him in on horses and mighty armies coming in his name. No, our savior, our Messiah, was born in a barn. You see, they didn't have any room for him in the inn. They didn't have any room for him. Joseph was knocking on doors and that hotel, sorry, we don't have room for you. And he was knocking on another door, sorry, we don't have room for you. And I feel like it symbolizes hearts even today because the question is, do you have room for Jesus? They didn't have room for him then, but really having room for him is having room for obedience to his word. If we don't have room for his word, we don't have room for Jesus. But you got to think, it didn't start in Bethlehem where they didn't have room for him. It started at the beginning. The hotels didn't have room for him, but think about the children of Israel. The children of Israel were brought out by the goodness of God. They're brought out by the love of Jesus. Brought out where God did not bring them out of Egypt in order to go to the promised land. That's not what he brought them out for. He brought them out to bring them to himself, to the promiser. God didn't bring the children out so that they could go to a promised land and forget about the giver. He brought them out so they could come to the giver himself. But when he tries to speak to them, it says Moses is on a mountain one day and God says, I want to speak to the people myself. I want to come down and speak to them. I've been longing to speak to them. And it says that they are so afraid of God's voice, they say, you just speak to him. We can't take it. His voice is like thunder and it's scaring us. We don't know about this God you serve, but you just hear from him and we'll just do whatever you say. Rejecting God. They don't have worm and room for his word. Think about that encounter. God revealing himself, becoming vulnerable, but his own people don't want to listen to his voice. How about all the kings? First and second kings, we constantly see. If you read one king, it said he followed the ways of God his father. But then 10 other kings, they followed the evil ways of their father. They followed the evil ways of their father. They followed the evil ways of their father. God making himself available. God constantly trying to seek the children of Israel. God constantly trying to seek Israel itself, for they were his precious possession but constantly he's being rejected again and again. Think about all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. What are they trying to do? God is trying to come back to his people. The Bible said he wanted, he longed to bring them to him like a hen would come to her chicks where he would come over them. He longed for his people. Jesus wept over his city when he was on earth because he so longs for you. He so loves you. He so wants you, but he's rejected again. Listen to this amazing scripture. When Jesus is walking and he's doing his ministry, Matthew 8, 33 through 34. It says the herdsmen fled. He had just cast out a demon and cast out all of these devils into a herd of sheep, to a herd of pigs. These pigs then ran off the edge and drowned themselves in the water. And it says this, look at this. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town, telling everyone what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Then the entire town came out to meet Jesus. And look at these words. They begged him to go away and leave them alone. They begged Jesus to leave them alone. He did something they weren't comfortable with. He did something they weren't used to. He challenged the things that they saw on a daily basis and they didn't have room for him. Can you imagine begging the healer of all healers to leave? Can you imagine begging the miracle worker to leave? Can you imagine? They walked out. He wasn't able to go into that town. Don't you know there were people who needed to be healed in that town? Don't you know there were families who needed Jesus' touch in that town? But he wasn't able to because of religious people. Religious people kicked him out. But you and I, we have the question, every time he was rejected, remember this, he came back with mercy. He keeps coming back with kindness. He keeps coming back with love. He keeps coming again and again. Who else is like Jesus who's willing to be rejected as many times as maybe you've rejected him? But he still was there for you. What has Jesus done for you when you rejected him again and again? Has he showed up again and again? Has he constantly been there again and again? Who has he forgiven? Has he forgiven you of anything? Has he saved you of anything? Has God done a miracle for any of you? 
This Jesus doesn't deserve rejection. This Jesus deserves praise. This Jesus deserves adoration. This Jesus deserves a hallelujah. So let's say it together. Hallelujah, highest praise. Hallelujah, highest praise. Hallelujah, highest praise. Hallelujah. Jesus for Christmas. Amen. Jesus is the reason for Christmas. He's the reason we shout. He's the reason we praise. If this is your first time here to the Wayroad Outreach, we're crazy about one man. His name is Jesus. We're crazy about praising Jesus. The reason why we celebrate is because of what Jesus has done for us. You see, some of us can't hold back our praise even if we wanted to. It's impossible when you know what Jesus has done for me. How could we be quiet when he got me off of the streets? How could we be quiet when he got me off of drugs and alcohol? How could you stay quiet? We know the reason for Christmas. His name is Jesus. You see, but in our time today, in modern times, we're making Christmas more about everything else except Jesus. It's more about the presents. It's more about unwrapping what I've wanted. It's more about my Christmas list. It's more about decorations. We have all the decorations on the outside, but in the inside, many of us are depressed. We're full of loneliness. Don't you know it's possible to look beautiful on the outside with all the makeup, but in your heart, you're sick. You need help. Jesus was a gift that was meant to be unwrapped, not kept in the box. Hallelujah. You see, they've tried to take Jesus even out of Christmas. They don't want to call it Christmas anymore. They want to call it Xmas. There's no Christ anymore in Christmas. They're taking him out of schools. They're trying to take him out of your homes. We're in a time right now where the idea of knowing Jesus, isn't it funny how every other religion, their books can be publicized on TV, nobody's threatened. The Quran. Buddhists can get up there, they'll invite them on their talk shows, but the moment somebody starts talking about Jesus, they're canceled. We're in a cancel culture. You don't want to say what I want to hear, and I'm going to cancel you. You don't have a message that I want to hear, and I'm going to cancel you. But don't you know it started with Jesus first? They didn't like what he said. They didn't have room for his words. But even in many churches, we're celebrating reindeer and Santa Claus more than Jesus. Even in many churches, we're celebrating other Christmas stories like the Grinch or the Elf or Home Alone. I don't think there's anything wrong with these, but are we talking about Jesus in our home? You see, today it's all about our gifts and what we want. But Jesus didn't come to do what he wanted. He didn't come to please himself. He came to give himself. He became the gift. He came to serve. Matthew 20, verse 25 through 28, listen. But Jesus called them together and he said this, you know that the rulers of this world lord it over you. Their officials flaunt their authority, but among you it will be different. Among you, my people, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus became the gift. Some of y'all have not unwrapped him, but we're going to give you a chance tonight. We're going to give you a time where you're going to be able to receive this beautiful gift of Jesus. Those who know him have a responsibility to share him. So right now the ushers have candles. They have, they have their lighters. What we're going to do, you received a candle when you came in here today. And they're going to light the candle at the end of the row. And then you're simply going to share your candle with the person next to you. And this is symbolic. What it's going and what it's saying is this. Our lights are candles now that we share with the person next to them because we're remembering this. You've been placed in a family. You've been placed in a family. You're not alone anymore. I don't know where you came from, but this is a family. And all of the encouragement, some of you, only thing that you actually need that's only holding you back from what you need in your breakthrough is simply to be reminded that there's somebody walking alongside of you. And as you're passing this candle and this light to the person next to you, please realize this. There's a supporter that's next to you. There's strength that's next to you. 
there's hope that's next to you. Jesus will not leave you an orphan. He doesn't want orphans. He places orphans in families, the Word of God says. So as we're doing this, we go into our next songs and this next part. Carefully, let this sink deep into you that you are not alone, that you're part of a family. It's called the body of Christ. The Wayworld Outreach, if this is your first time, we welcome you into our family. Because once you come once, you're now part of the So right now as we go into this next worship, let's think about this. And let God maybe heal you. Even through this moment, he might touch your heart and tell you you're not alone. Jesus is what makes Christmas merry. Jesus is what makes Christmas special. But do you understand how precious of a gift that you have? Do you understand we were able to have a Merry Christmas because Jesus, for what he did 2,000 years ago for you and me, without that sacrifice, happiness is only temporary. You don't have true joy. You don't have true peace without realizing that sacrifice that gave you everything. How precious really is this gift? Matthew 13, 44 through 46 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. You see, who is the pearl? Jesus is the pearl. Jesus is worth selling everything you have to get him. Jesus is worth giving up everything you have to have him. It said that when it was hidden in that field, the pearl, it was so worth it, the man said nothing else matters. And that's the way we should be. This Christmas, we're grateful for the presents. We're grateful for the family. Whether you have family or whether you feel alone this Christmas, I want you to know there is a gift that is greater than any gift you'll ever receive under a tree because he hung on a tree 2,000 years ago. And that gift is for you, and for you, and for you, and for every single one of you. Never forget this last scripture here, Matthew 19, 27. Peter said to Jesus, we've given everything to follow you. What will we get? You see, Peter realized, as we all have, and many of you in this building, who've given your life for this ministry, there is nothing else worth giving everything up. Moving jobs, moving continents, moving states, we moved from Georgia, my wife and I and my entire family, from the other side of the United States to come to the Wayroad Outreach because God had a call. And he said, you know what? My words, are they worth it to you, Gavin? We obeyed the words because following Jesus' words is making room for Jesus. God bless you. In 21, 21 through 23, here's the moment. Revelation 21, 21 through 23. The 12 gates, this is a picture of heaven. The 12 gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb of God is its light. Do you understand what John is saying that he saw? He's saying that even in heaven, heaven where there's no tears, there's no weeping, it's gold streets up there, it's, it's bright, it, it, the glory of God is all around. Even in heaven, Jesus is bright and shines. There's no need of any other light because Jesus' light illuminates all of heaven. <laughs> You're holding a light in your hand. That candle's producing light and all of our lights together are producing light enough for this room. But a light that feels all of heaven in one individual's body? <laughs> Jesus shines and he's, listen, it's already bright in heaven, but Jesus is bright even in heaven. Whoop! 
He is the bright and morning star. You see, Moses had a predicament. He came to God one time and he was on a mountain and he was following a sheep trying to get him. And the Bible said there was a burning bush. God speaks from the bush. We know the story. Moses, within the conversation, after he's complaining and after he's given excuses for why God can't use him, just like a lot of us do, it says that he asked him a question. He says, who will I say sent me? Uh, if I do do this, God, who, who am I going to say sent me? And God had to actually take a moment. He said, that's a good question. Hmm. Because you don't know it yet, Moses. But when you're in the midst of a desert and there's no light around you, I'm going to be a pillar of fire to keep you warm. You don't know it yet, Moses, but in the middle of the day, if you get too hot, I'm going to be a cloud over you all day long so you never get sunburned. You don't know it yet, Moses, but I'm going to never let your shoes wear out from 40 years of walking. Those shoes will stay all nice and prim. You don't know it yet, Moses, but I'm not going to let you get sick for one day for 40 years. You're not going to get sick. So, so I, I just tell him I, just tell him I am is sending you because I am. I am whatever you need me to be. Look at these names of God. These are just a few. I am El Shaddai. I'm God Almighty. I'm Jehovah Nisa. I'm God your banner. I'm Jehovah Ra. The Lord my shepherd, he leads me. I'm Jehovah Rapha. I'm the God that heals you. I'm Jehovah Shama. The Lord is there. You might not think he's there, but he's working even when you can't see him working. I'm Jehovah Sid Canoe. I'm the Lord my righteousness. You see, without Jesus, you can't stand in front of God. You're not worthy to be in his presence, but Jesus became your righteousness, my God. I'm Jehovah Mekhetsedesh. I'm the one who sanctifies you. I'll make you clean. I'm El Olam, the everlasting God. I'm Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Ah, my God. I'm Jehovah Shalom. God is my peace. Some of y'all need peace. You're looking for peace in the wrong place. Peace is a person. Let me say it again. Peace is a person. His name is Jesus. I'm Jehovah Shabbat. I'm the Lord of hosts. He's got an army. He can fight against the battles you're fighting against. He can come against the wars you're coming against. Let me tell you something. If you're saved in this place, you're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. He feels all in all, and he's the answer. But let me tell you this real quick. You're ruined for God. Even if you're not saved, let me tell you, what, let me, let me tell you an answer you're going to need to know. You're ruined for God. Let me tell you why. Genesis 2, 7. It said the Lord God had formed a man in the earth and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The moment he blew into the nostrils of man, it said that man exhaled the breath of God. Listen, it was not his own breath. It was borrowed breath from God. The first breath we ever took was not our own, but borrowed breath from God. What is God saying? You were meant to be filled from me from the beginning and you can't survive without me. You can't take one breath without me. You can't do one day without me. Listen to this verse. This is powerful. Ecclesiastes 3.11. This is another reason you're ruined for God. You're ruined. You're, I'm just telling you, you're not going to find it anywhere else. Yet God has made everything beautiful in his time and he planted eternity in your heart. Now eternity is an unquantifiable number. You can't quantify it. You can't measure it. There's no way to measure eternity. It's way too big of an, ob of an object or, or even a thought process to try to comprehend. You cannot comprehend eternity. But God put it inside of your heart. Why? So that your life would continue to call out a need for God. You can't know. You don't know why you get more girlfriends, but you're not happy still. You don't know why you're still uh, filling your life with, with drugs or maybe alcohol, but you're not feeling satisfied. You're, you, you don't know why you still are going through the same cycles and going to the same bars and you're with the same people and you're going to the same New Year's Eve party that you're planning to go on this year and you're going to go to the same place you were at last year. And you're going to get as drunk as possible and somebody's going to have to drive you home and, but then you're going to look forward to it again next year and you're not happy with it anymore. I'm talking to somebody who's unsatisfied. It's because God ruined you. He put eternity in your heart. There's something inside of you that knows there's something more. 
There's something inside of you that knows there's something more than the life you're living. And if I'm speaking to you right now, don't ignore the call because the gift is here. His name is Jesus. He's knocking on your door. So as we have these candles in our hands, I want to say this. In just a moment, we're going to blow out these candles. But please understand what we're blowing out. These candles, I want you to see them as representing your past. Many of y'all, it's the past of things you'd like to forget in 2023. You want to leave it here. Some of y'all, you had a great year. But there's more for you that God wants to do. And you can't go into the new year with the same faith you've had this year. You can't go into the new year with the same expectation you did this year. I don't care if you have five miracles. God wants to give you ten next year. I don't care. You see, here's the deal. If you're still walking with Jesus, he's always moving forward. He's never in park and he's never in reverse. So God still has more for you to accomplish. Just like he told Joshua, there is yet more land to possess. There's more, listen, there's more single women to put in that woman's home. There's more men on the street to get off of drugs. There's more souls. How many of y'all right in here have family members who still aren't saved? Well, guess what 2024 is, baby? 2024 is the time for the family. So right now, I want you with that in mind, when you blow out this candle, I want you to make this a spiritual thing. Don't just blow out a candle. Make it a spiritual significance. I'm blowing out my other capacity. I'm blowing out my past. And I'm receiving the new that God wants to give me. Everybody blow it out now. Praise Him for it. Praise Him for a new start. Praise Him for a new start. Praise Him for a new time. Praise Him for a new year. Praise Him. Come on, y'all ain't praising him. You're not thanking him enough. You're not, hey, I don't care if it was good. It could be better. I don't care. God is there. God is there. God is there. Hey. Praise him. Now, every person right here, look at me right here. This is the moment we're all here for tonight. This is the greatest moment. Romans 5.8. Because there's somebody, I can feel it. I can feel your heart in the room. Your heart is thumping out of your chest because you don't know this Jesus. You don't have this gift that I'm talking about. The people who are here shouting and screaming is because of one man. It wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of a pastor. It was because Jesus came into our life. Jesus ruined us. Jesus took us. Romans 5.8. God showed his great love for us. He showed it for you whose heart is beating right now, I'm speaking to you. And he said that even he came and died when you were still a sinner. Listen, he's saying when you ignored him, God is still pursuing you. I don't care how, maybe you've been in church, but you just say, you know what, church is just, you know what, but tonight something feels different. Tonight something's happening on the inside. Jesus came for you. I just want you to know, he loved you before you would ever choose him. He loved you before you would ever pray a prayer. He loved you before you would ever do an outreach. He already came for you. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, Jesus died for you so that at this moment you could call out to his name. <laughs> Romans 3.23, we got to realize this, that every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are failures without Jesus. Do you know that I'm not special because of my personality? I'm not going to do something because I'm great. I'm going to do it because Jesus is great. He'll give you a boldness. But you've got to understand that you fall short. God requires something of you. He requires perfection. But you can't meet that. So Jesus had to come down and do it for you. So you get to take his sacrifice because he paid what you couldn't pay. And here's the last one, John 3, 16. This is the good news. Are you ready? God so loved. He so loves you. If you're in the back corner, he so loves you. If you're on the right side, he so loves you. Over here, he so loves you. He so loves you. That he sent the greatest gift of all, Jesus. And whosoever, that's whoever, from the back to the front, if you want to call upon his name tonight, you will be saved. So here's my question. Everybody's already standing. I don't want you to waste another moment. If you say, I want Jesus, altar team, please come up. And we're going to ask you right now to get out of the aisle. One, two, three. Come on. Come and receive Jesus right now. Give him a hand. You say, I want to receive Jesus. Come on. Let us pray with you tonight. Let us pray with you. I see you coming from the back. I see you coming from the back and the sides. Come on. We're ready for you. Look at him coming over here. Come on. Clap, church. Clap like it's your own family. Clap like it's your own brother. 
Thank you, God. Look at these people. I see a, I see a couple coming from the back over here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every person right now, you want to receive Jesus. Don't go home tonight without peace. Don't go home tonight without peace. As they're coming up, we're going to sing this song. You're worthy of it all again. If everybody could lift their hands. Close your eyes. We're going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. But hey, there's still people coming. I want to give them time. I want to give them time. Let's go ahead and sing. Let's give them time as they keep coming up. Nobody leaving right now. We're still early. Make room for them over here.